Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Good evening, everyone. This is Bishop Mel. We are now in the segment of our prayer line live, O oh God, that we can share with you the holy, precious word of God. The title of the message tonight is My Passion for Christ. My Passion for Christ. Our text tonight came from the book of Philippians, chapter 3 until verse 1, verses 1 to 21st. Okay, just open your Bible, Philippians chapter 3, the whole chapter. Let me just open up in prayer. Father, in the name of Jesus, thank you once more that you have given us and afforded us the opportunity, the privilege to come once more before your throne of grace, power and healing, O God. Father, in the name of Jesus, we come before you, Spirit of truth, O God, who comes from the Father so that we can share with you your word, O God, your precious word tonight on this prayer line, live God. Lord, thank you, Lord, for this prayer line live, for your sustaining power that we can go on, go on, go on until, Lord, O God, until your return, God. So thank you, Lord, for this privilege, O God, that we can stand in the gap of your people who are in need tonight, God. So we give you all the glory, the praises, and the honor of the word that you have impressed upon my heart, O God, to relay it to your people, O God, for your glory, for your honor, in Jesus, in Jesus' precious holy name. The title of the message again tonight is My Passion for Christ. You know, knowing Christ reveals the true value of our lives. That's why in the book of Philippians chapter 3 verse 8, it says here, I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. You know, our passion governed the enthusiasm we put in anything. In fact, synonym for the word passion include terms like ultimate delight or great desire or intense interest and fervor. So, uh, and when it comes to passion for Christ, the Apostle Paul gave us one of the finest examples of passion we could ever examine. The passage in Philippians that we consider in this message tonight spills out what it means to be passionate about Jesus. Through these verses that we are going through tonight, we can examine our passion for, for Jesus Christ. If we have won, and if necessary, adjust it accordingly. Our passion for Christ must be reflected in our desire to be like Him. If you... If, so tonight, as we go through our text tonight, in the book of Philippians, I would just uh, illustrate to you about what pertains to passion. Do you know that an athlete with a passion for his game will have a few problems attending practice session or even participating in the next, next big game? So whatever other demands on his schedule for the week, they will take second place to practicing for and playing in the game to win. This is the same thing is true for a student with a passion for studying. She will have little trouble motivating herself to pass every exam in order to graduate whatever course He's, he or she is taking. What passion does for the athlete and the student, it can also do for every believer in Christ. Passion, listen to this, describe strong love, intense interest, and enthusiastic devotion. Transfer the term to your relationship with Christ and you can understand this message tonight is a revival and a renewal you know passion for christ provides the fuel 
needed to set on fire or to burn revival and renewals flames. It motivates you, you and me, to do the kind of things you want to accomplish in our lives. Confess your sin. Obey God's word. Give yourself to spiritual discipline and worship and praise God. You know, this message tonight leads us to teaching of one of the great examples of Christ-centered passion. No other than the Apostle Paul. Evaluate your own passion for the Lord in the light of this passage of Scripture tonight. And see if you really have the passion for Christ. Go to the book of Philippians chapter 3 verses 1 to 7. Philippians chapter 3 verses 1 to 7. Here, Apostle Paul saw passion for Christ as a safeguard against false teaching that threatened the freedom Christ provides believers with in Philippos or in the, the believers in Philipp, Philippos or Philippians. It provides you the same protection. That's why alternate religion offer a spirit a spiritual is most gar, uh, is most to or choices where people can pick and choose from the many options presented to them. That's why the number of these groups claims testify to the fact many are looking for a means to enter into a relationship with God on their own terms on their own ways rather than through the grace of God found in the gospel of Jesus Christ. So there is nothing new here. You know in Paul's day, Apostle Paul's day, Judaizer re regularly infiltrated, you know, churches during that time. They thought that believers needed to keep the Mosaic law to experience salvation. No, but, but Apostle Paul did not mince or chop it to pieces the words when he spoke of this false teacher. That's why in verse 2 of Philippians chapter 3 verse, uh, verse, uh, chapter 3 verse 2, it says here, what's out, what's out for these dogs, those men who do evil, those mutilators of the flesh, so Apostle Paul called them Dog, the false teacher. He's straightforward in saying this because he has the passion for Christ. So he called them Dog, despise, uh, despise opposition, and went on to refer to them as evil workers and mutilator of the flesh. This is a reference to circumcision, an Old Testament rite that these teachers insisted men to undergo to be saved. But Apostle Paul saw this teaching for what they were, they were, substitute for the glorious freedom of the gospel. They substitute it for the freedom. So passion for Christ, listen to this, demands that you exercise the same separation from Paul's teaching as Paul's as Apostle Paul did during that day. So your passion for the Lord must lead you to turn away. Turn away from the falsehood, false teaching, even today as you listen to this, uh, to, to the TV evangelists. Most of them are teaching false, false doctrine. Apostle Paul offered more than exhortation on the on the matter in fact he practiced what he preached he walked what he talked he had a place his confidence in Christ that is his confidence in Christ in Christ alone no other so as a believer he put all those former false teaching aside in order to please what to please the Lord it says here verse 7 but 
Whatever was to my profit, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. So, Apostle Paul left a tremendous example to follow for each and every one of us, even on this prayer line. That's why passion for Christ demand, demands the same for you and me. That's why substitute for what He offers you will be seen for what they are. Copies. Copies of the real thing. If you are passionate for Christ, they will hold no appeal for you anymore. Because they are just copies. They are false teaching, false doctrine. Go to verses 8 to 11. Hallelujah. You know, passion in human relationship leads people to desire to spend time with each other. You know that. In fact, men and women who are passionately in love commit themselves to each other in marriage. In their vows, they pledge themselves to each other and promising to forsake all other relationship and to give themselves wholly to their spouses. So passion for Christ leads to the same kind of wholehearted commitment, a truth Paul displayed clearly in his own life. So he is one of these examples of someone so passionately for Christ. So after having listed the reason he could boast of his own spiritual accomplishment in verse, verses 4 to 6, that's why it says even in verse 4, in verse 4, Though I myself have reason for such confidence, if anyone else think he has reason to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. As for zeal, verse 6, persecuting the church, as for legalistic righteousness, faultless, he has them all, but he changed. Now he has passion for Christ. Apostle Paul made the surprising statement that he considered all this as nothing more than refuse, a garbage, no spiritual value. He considered all those things as dung and garbage. So why would a man of Paul's stature in, Jud in Judaism turn his back on such a great record of zeal and effort? One reason, his passion for Christ. He turned away from any false doctrine, any false uh, belief because of his passion for Christ. This holy passion placed everything in its proper perspective. What was once so vital and important become virtually worthless, become garbage, become dung, refuse, as Paul enthroned Christ in his heart and devotion. So having become consumed with an, with an ardent love for the Lord Jesus Christ, Apostle Paul lived with a new focus. Listen to this. For Apostle Paul, it was no longer all about me, all about myself, all about what I am doing. But life was now all about Him. That's why Galatians 2.20, it says, I have been crucified with Christ. I, I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. It's no longer Him. Even John the Baptist said that, let me decrease so that He may increase. This is the passion of, of Apostle Paul. He, he has a new pursuit, occupied his interest and effort, such as Christ's righteousness. Not legalistic effort that was filthy rags, but before a holy God. His passion is a deeper knowledge of Christ, more than just knowing about Him, but experiencing Him. You can find us in Philippians 3, verse 10. We just don't want to know Christ. We have to experience Him. We have to have an encounter with Him. Like what Apostle Paul did on his way to Damascus. He has an encounter. 
experience of life beyond the grave. This should be our passion. We should have an experience of life beyond the grave. That's why passion for Christ fuels this kind of consecration. Whatever occupied center stayed in our life before passion for Christ began to burn, become, bec become a, a garbage. Step aside as Jesus take the spot, uh, spotlight as Lord of your life. Put everything aside. Your goal, your ambition. Put them aside and take Jesus on the spotlight as Lord of your life. You see personal effort put forth for God's approval as what it really is. A vain attempt to, place, to please God by human pride will never work. A shallow knowledge of Christ give way to a deep desire to know Him in the most personal, intimate way you can. You final, finally see this life for what it is. A pleading, transitory thing that is so temporary, it is no longer worth giving your love and devotion to. You want a permanent passion for Christ. Passion for Christ lights revivals. Revival fire and enables to glow of renewal, to continue to burn brightly forever and ever. Go to verse 12 to, to, to verses 21. The same chapter, Philippians chapter 3. You know, Christian, you and me must not, must not confuse passion with pride. Okay? Passion for Christ never leads to a situation where a believer sets satisfied with having arrived at such a, a, a spiritual height. No. Apostle Paul made this clear in Philippians chapter 3, verse 12 to 14. It says here, Not that I have already obtained all this or have already been made perfect, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers, verse 13, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead. Verse 14, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me, called you and me, heavenward in Christ Jesus. So he described himself as not having already attained and not being already perfect. He saw passion not as a place but a pursuit. His passion for Christ caused him to focus not on where he was but where he was going. Passion propelled him. It may propel you into a lifelong pursuit of Christ. A pursuit that had its goal, not this life, but the next life. We have the view of the next life if you pursue Christ. The same thing will be true in the matter of your own passion for the Lord. If you are truly passionate for Christ tonight, you will not allow yourself to become satisfied with the progress you have made. Instead, you will keep pursuing and pursuing higher goal, aiming not for uh, no progress, but for heights that are beyond the grave. Choosing to live life this way is a step toward a spiritual maturity. Verse 15, just read verse 15 and 16 for your maturity. The Christian who lives according to this passionate life, lifestyle will never find his spiritual life stagnating. It will continue. Go to verse 17 to 21. Vividly picture the result of a passionate pursuit of Christ. For one thing you follow in the step of others like Paul. In a lifestyle of passion. So tonight, hallelujah, 
While there are many Christians who are excellent examples of living with passion for Christ, there are also people whose example you are to avoid following. Remember this. They are examples of those who live for other passion, their own. Paul described a group of false teachers, false teaching, false doctrine, who taught that since salvation came by grace, Believers did not need to restrict their behavior in any way. Some of them would say, once saved, forever saved. No! He pictured them as enemies of the cross. He also expoke, ex exposed where their passion really were, for fulfilling their own self-centered goals and desires. You cannot use grace as an ex excuse to follow selfish or sinful pursuit. Grace gives freedom to pursue Christ-like living, not freedom from the consequences of willful sin. So how drastically different is the pursuit of the person whose passion is Christ? He looks forward to the return of the one he worships, he adores, and follows. That's why verse 20 it says, But our citizenship is in heaven. And we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. So these are the pursuit of everyone who has a passion for Christ. Because he knows the transformation that will take place at Christ's return. So at his coming, the Christian, motivated by passion for Christ, will enjoy. Listen to this will enjoy what his or her passion has always pursued through Christ-likeness in Christ. You don't have to wait until Christ return to be a Christ-centered, passionate lifestyle. No! Embrace passion for Christ and spend your life striving to be like Jesus. For only at the end of your earthly life will you reach that Goal, hallelujah. You will reach that goal as you pursue Christ. So, examine your, passion, your own passion tonight. What exactly steers your zeal in the light? Hopefully there are people, principles, and things in your life that you find yourself passionate about. Okay? Now examine how you relate to its, to its passion. No doubt you will find that the people, principles, and things that evoke your passion bring, up, bring out your best efforts, your greatest zeal, and your sincerest concern. Now apply this to your relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Just do it. Your passion for Him will have a direct bearing on how you work, labor for Him. And how zealous you are over what concerns the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why passion for the Lord will, will serve the part of purpose of bringing order to your life. You will have an easier time getting everything in your life in its proper place. When Jesus rises, rises above all as your greatest passion. Make a commitment to live passionate, passionately for the Lord starting tonight. It is a commitment you'll never regret for the rest of your life till His return. You know, thinking about Paul's image, Apostle Paul's image of the athlete that I mentioned before can help us understand how we may become more passionate about our Lord. You know, athletes who excel, give themselves unreservedly to more, uh, you know, unreservedly to their sport. All other activities become secondary as the athlete prepare himself for the big game and give himself to competition. Are we the same way in relation to the Lord? Or is our devotion to Him divided by many activities in this world we are so preoccupied 
of things of this world and enter it that clatter our schedule are are we as focused on the finish finish line as the athlete as Paul described it is ending this life in a way that pleases God a top priority if God will call you today tonight what would he see in your heart is he uh, the top priority of your life or there's more others that occupy your life what we invest our time our money in speak it's uh, our money speak volumes about our passion for Jesus how much do you spend your time how much you spend your money it speak volumes about your passion for Jesus Christ it's of us must examine his or her passion for the Lord in light of eternity in one way or another or one day God will take us home but he will examine your passion for him in your life here on earth if we find that our answers are not what we would like them to be we can and must commit ourselves new and rekindling our passion for Christ starting tonight you, you know passion for Christ and participation in the Great Commission go hand in hand remember that and it reminds us that passion for Christ will lead us to reach out to the lost lead them in a prayer of commitment to Christ and passion for Christ for his glory for his honor in Jesus in Jesus precious holy name Amen. Hallelujah. Let me just close up in prayer. Hallelujah. Who praise God. Thank you, Lord, tonight that we acknowledge, God, who you are. You are our shepherd, and we shall not want. Lead us, Lord. You are the good shepherd. We know that, and we are the sheep of your pasture. Thank you, God, for your loving care for us. You are the door that opens to an entirely new life, God. You are our fortress. You are our defense. You are the rock upon whom the, the church is built, God. And the gates of hell will never prevail against it. You are our peace. You are our hope. You are our passion, the rock of refuge. Our high tower, our shield, our buckler. You protect us, Lord, and you keep us safe all the days of our life. You are the word tonight that became flesh, God, and dwelt among us. The word of blood. You are our righteousness. You are all in all to us, Lord. You are the strength of our life. You are the light and our salvation. We thank you, Lord, tonight that you are the first and the last, the Alpha and the Omega. You are the Son of Righteousness. You are called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, and the Prince of Peace. You are the Holy One of Israel. You are our passion, Lord. You are my passion. Because you are Jesus the Savior of the world, and yet you are my personal Lord and Savior and friend. We stand in awe and reverence of your gift of love for dying for us at the cross. For even though you are the King of kings and the Lord of lords, you are willing to die for each and every single one of us here tonight. So at your name, Lord, every knee must bow and every tongue must confess that you are Lord to the glory of God, the Father. Yet you are the God in whom we live and move and have our being, in whom all our needs are met, starting tonight, God. We exalt your name in all the earth, for you are our passion for the glory of your name. In Jesus, in Jesus' precious holy name, amen. Hallelujah.